Welcome to the study of God's Word, recorded live from Calvary Chapel in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media, visit us online at calvaryaurora.org or download our free app on all platforms. And now, let's open our Bibles and study God's Word. Good morning, everybody. Honored, blessed to uh, be able to teach the Word in the best church in Colorado, right? I believe that. And I pastor a church in Colorado. I do. I brought some people yesterday, like, what? It's like, yeah, I would probably just now start coming to my church. Um, Anybody new here in the last year to Calvary Church? Raise your hand. All right, welcome. Praise the Lord that you guys are here. I want to just encourage you guys that this, I I truly believe, is such an incredible church. And I just want to share a couple things with you of my observation. I've been here in Colorado for six years, and I call this my keeping church. I came from uh, California to Boulder, so that's like two strikes against me. And uh, depending on how I do today, that might be three. Um, So, Just want to encourage you guys, this is an amazing church, and also those of you that have been coming for, like Michael, 20 years, and uh, just the impact that you guys have had in this area, and also really around the world. Last time I was here, uh, you guys had a bunch of flags on the ceiling, and uh, came on a Wednesday, it's a pretty rough day for me, get blessed, get filled up, and um, just your guys' mission. Win, disciple, send. Amen? Win people for Jesus Christ. See them become Christians. Build them up. Right? See them learn about Jesus, love Jesus, and then sent out all around the world. But really starting with the person next to you. Amen? Starting now, we get to practice on each other, to love each other. And so uh, this morning, we are going to look at a letter that I believe, if Jesus were to write a letter to Calvary Church, this is what he would write. So we're in the book of Revelation. Book of Revelation. End times. All right. Before you guys get carried away or anything, before I do, what's Revelation all about? Well, it says, right? This book is not hard to understand. Revelation, anybody got their Bibles, right? Or fake Bibles, got your phone? You should open it up. And uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1 says, it's the revelation of? Jesus. Thank you, bro. Got one person ready. Okay, just so you guys know, you'll, you'll help me out. Don't talk to each other, but you can talk to me. So... You guys ready? It's the revelation of Jesus. Jesus. See, if we don't, thank you. If we don't see Jesus, we're doing something wrong. In the book of Revelation, in every book, every page, we see Jesus. Amen? Now, also, there's a reason why people don't want to read uh, this book is, I believe, the enemy. And there's a promise blessing. It says, verse 3, blessed is he who reads those who hear the words of the prophecy and keep those things which are written in it. Anybody going to be blessed this morning, right? You guys are hearing it. You guys are reading it. But really, the blessing comes when you obey the word of Christ. Amen? Now, also, this book isn't hard to understand. There's a divine outline. You're like, it's not hard to understand. Revelation. Come on, man. Uh, Verse 19, take a look. There's a divine outline about this book. It says, write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. So, It breaks up into three sections, and the first thing is the things you have seen. That's chapter one. Who do we see in chapter one? Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, Lord of lords, King of kings, eyes of fire, feet of brass, sword coming out of his mouth. Like, that's Jesus? Like, yes, he is the conquering king, amen? Risen, and he's coming back again. Two people excited about that. Hopefully there's more after, after. Now, the things that are. Where are you right now? Like, I don't even know. You are at church. (laughs) We are in the church age. Jesus has not come back yet, but he's gonna soon. 
And so there's something for us to do. We are on a mission, amen? And we're gonna go to heaven because we believe in Jesus and we wanna take as many people with us as we possibly can, amen? Because it says, and the things that will take place after this. And this is usually what people think of when they think of the uh, book of Revelation. And even that phrase, the things after this, is the starting of chapter 4. And it says, come up here, and we see seven scenes of heaven. And then you don't see the church until chapter 19, coming back with Jesus. Amen? That we will be raptured. Now we, this generation... Guys, you should be more excited about that. I'm just saying, okay, I guess I just got to preach better or something. Maybe I'll stand behind here. (laughs) We might be the generation that doesn't die and Jesus comes and gets. Amen? And really, he's given us a job. He's given us a job to tell the whole world that he loves them because he doesn't want anyone to perish. And this is a wonderful church that does this. You guys win, disciple, send until the last person hears and he comes and gets us. Amen? All right. So let's take a look. Our our section of scripture is in chapter 3, verse 7 to 13. And I've entitled this, The Loving Church or The Missional Church. It says, verse 7, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, and have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and bow down before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes... I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Father, thank you for your word. God, we ask by your Holy Spirit, that you would speak to us, point us to Jesus, and change us, Lord. Let us become more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, a missional church, it's a loving church, it's a biblical church, and I believe that if Jesus were to write a letter to this church, and I've been studying this with, a, with uh, the church that I get a pastor, and uh, there's seven letters, and none of them are like really encouraging, except this one. And just thinking like, man, I want to be a part of a church and pastor a church like Philadelphia. And every time I've come here, I see that you guys are a Philadelphian church. And so let's pick it up here. Let me just share a couple things of insight uh, about you guys as an outsider looking in. In verse 7, it says, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, right. Now, the word angel is messenger, and very few commentators say that it's actually a spiritual being that is an angel, uh, but really it is the pastor, that Jesus wrote this letter to the pastor. And so Pastor Ed is an angel. Amen? Man, he's sent from the Lord. Uh, he's, not, he's not perfect. Nobody is. But he's a wonderful teacher, incredible leader. And um, also, he's a, he's a pastor to pastors. And so I just want to thank you guys uh, for sharing him. Uh, even this weekend, you're like, who is this guy? I don't know. I'm just filling in until he gets back. Uh, he's probably going out and you know, sharing his heart to uh, other churches or another pastor. And so I care very much for your pastor. And also, this is not an easy time to do anything, especially ministry. A lot of eyes are on you guys and on Pastor Ed. You know, when the pandemic hit, 
Uh, and they're like, okay, what are churches going to do in Denver? They came here, the news crews, you know, and so I'm just, I'm so thankful for how he's led. Um, you guys are kind of a flagship for especially the Calvary chapels and, uh, myself and a lot of other pastors look to pastor Ed and to you guys of what you guys are doing. What is it? It's uh, preference, patience, and humility. Man, I'm just so blessed to see how you guys have responded in this last year. Uh, and I believe the Lord is, is blessed as well. And so it says, to the angel of the church. The word church is ecclesia. That means literally called out of homes into one place. And uh, I know it was very difficult to not come to this place physically uh, when they said that we couldn't, but the doors are open now, amen? And so, you know, we need to be here gathering together. And um, I believe this, that, you know, the church is the way that it is because of its pastor, but also the pastor is the way that it is because of the church. And you guys encourage Pastor Ed. You know, the, the staff here, the way that they lead, and um, just honestly so blessed every time I, I come here. And the reason being, I believe, is you guys are a Philadelphia church. What's Philadelphia mean? Brotherly love. You guys ever been to Philadelphia? City of brotherly shove, right? Like not East Coasters. I don't know. I like them, but they got good food. Okay, I'm going to keep going. Uh, loving church, that's what it is. We're a family. Now let me say this at the, at, in the beginning. There is no perfect church, because you're here, right? Because we're not perfect. We're not in heaven. I'm sorry. If you guys were offended by that, it's true. Uh, welcome to church. You're a sinner. And uh, Pastor Ed isn't perfect. No person is perfect. No church is perfect. But we're a family, right? We're brothers and sisters. And uh, I got four boys. Brotherly love. You know what brotherly look, love looks like in my house? Wrestling, right? Uh, but they love each other, and they, they'll grow up to love each other. And so the fact of the matter is, Jesus is the perfect one, and our eyes are focused on him. And we love each other because Jesus first loved us. Amen? And so his love is poured into our hearts. We get to love one another. And then outside these doors, we go out and we love other people. And so this church being marked by love. And every missional loving church is focused on Jesus Christ. Amen? So here in all of the letters, Jesus, before he gives a rebuke, and then he gives um, an encouragement, and then he gives a promise. This church has no rebuke, but he always reminds the church of himself. And anybody need to be reminded of Jesus? Get their eyes fixed on Jesus? I do, constantly. Jesus says this, to the angel of the church, verse 7, in Philadelphia, right? These things says, he who is holy... He who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. Jesus says of himself, I'm holy, I'm true. Those are characteristics that are only for God, amen? And so holiness is actually the attribute that's spoken of the most about God. It's not mercy, it's not love, it's not justice, it's his holiness. Now holiness means purity, it means perfection. And there are angels right now that have, since they've been created and for, you know, eternity, they will see Jesus and they will sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That God is so perfect, he is so, whole, like, you know, pure, different, separate, that when we see him, we'll see that and we can't help but worship him. Now, Jesus alone is sinless. Jesus alone is perfect. But here's the wonderful thing, is that when you believe in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes inside of you and he regenerates you. He gives you a new life, a new start, and you'll never become sinless, but you should sin less, amen? The more that you walk with Jesus, the more that you see Jesus in his holiness, it changes us. And then he also says that he's true, that he's reality, that he's genuine. We need that. In a world of lies, in a world of opinions, in a world of we're not really sure what is true, we have Jesus and we have his word, amen? I have a buddy that uh, works for Fortune 500 companies and he, uh, he finds out 
those that are, uh, you know, theft and also doing counterfeiting money. And the way that they trained him was not to find all the counterfeits, but to hold the real genuine article. And they said, hold it in your pocket, hold it in your hand, you know, make yourself you know, recognizing what is true. And he said, the same thing is like the word of God. It's not necessarily that we need to find every single lie. We need to hold the real thing. Amen. We need to behold Jesus who is true. We need to read the word, which is true. Amen. And then we can spot a lie. Now, Jesus saying these attributes of himself, that he is holy, that he is true. uh, These things can be quite frightening, honestly, if you don't know Jesus Christ. Because you will stand before a holy and true God that sees all the sin in our life. And if you're not covered by the blood of Jesus, then he will justly send you to hell. And that's what he says here, actually. Uh, Verse 7, it says, he who has the key of David. If you could just turn back a a page or so and look at chapter 1, verse 18. And Jesus reminding the church of what who he is, and he says in verse 18, I am he who lives. I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. Jesus is alive. Amen? Amen. He's the only person who has died and risen himself up and still alive, right? He's set apart from every other person. Buddha, he died, he stayed dead. Muhammad died, stayed dead. Joseph Smith died, stayed dead. Anybody, you and me, unless we get raptured, die, will stay dead. Jesus, risen from the dead, proving everything that he said, everything that he did, proving that he is God himself, amen? We worship a God who hears our praise that is in the midst of us, right? If two or three are gathered in his name, Jesus is there, amen? Now, he says he has the keys, and he says the keys of David, but in verse 18, it says, and I have the keys of Hades and of death. Now, because Jesus was in the line of David, he is the Messiah. There's 456 prophecies in the Old Testament that speak of the the Messiah, the Jewish Savior, uh, the God-man, and uh, he fulfilled 316. Now, there's still 140 more for him to fulfill in his second coming. But he's the only person that could fulfill the, uh, the one who is the Messiah. And so he has the keys. When he rose from the dead, he snatched the keys, right? And he has the keys for death and hell. Now, again, that can be kind of frightening if you don't know Jesus Christ, because we will go to hell and suffer for our sin, which is just if we do not believe in the one that holds those keys. But he also unlocked the door for heaven. Amen? That he has opened a way for us to be saved. Jesus said, I am the door. He said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so we need to praise Jesus and let people know that there is a way that we don't have to suffer for our sin in hell, that Jesus has died for our sins, opened up a door for salvation, and also not only that, but opened up a door for opportunity, which is what I'd like to share with you guys and how you as a church walk through open doors. And um, when we believed in Jesus he didn't just take us to heaven, right? There's going to be one person, the last Gentile that believes in Jesus, and then he gets like, or she gets raptured, like, oh, that was easy, right? But we haven't. We have a job to do. So we walked through the door of salvation. He broke our chains of sin, right, and death, and now we get to live a free life in Christ, and we walk through not just the door of salvation, but doors of opportunity, that God has good works in store for you and me. And so he says, no man can open, no man can shut. When Jesus is in it, nothing can stop it. Amen? Now, here's five encouragements that I see from the Lord to a loving church. And um, if you guys want to check it out, Pastor Ed, I believe, taught in 2011 or something like that, the book of Revelation, and he goes through uh, church history. And this church, Philadelphia, is to represent the missional church that started in the 1700s and is to today until Jesus comes back. And so with these encouragements, I'll tell you a couple stories of some great missionaries, uh, but I believe that these encouragements are for you guys. 
for Calvary Church. Let's take a look. It says, verse 8, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door. No one can shut it, for you have a little strength and have kept my word and have not denied my name. So Calvary Church, the first thing that I believe the Lord wants to share with you is that he knows your works. Amen? Um, I've gone through, I like working. I don't know if you like working. I enjoy it, you know, with that like, um, what is it, uh, that you can adopt little things, like clean up the, lar- the yard. Man, I might, if you guys don't do it, I'm going to come here and I'm going to go clean some, some uh, one of those sections. Now, I remember reading this or hearing this in a sermon that Jesus knows my works because I thought that the height of Christianity is being on staff at a church, right? Like I'm not actually serving the Lord unless I'm in the church building. And the Lord really shifted things for me um, when I was working in construction and going from job to job. And the Lord said, I know your works. Your job is your ministry. Where you are, mom, watching those little kids, that's your ministry. What a wonderful ministry that is. Amen? Wherever you go, you are on the clock that you work for Jesus. Whatever you do. Now, you can come here, and there's lots of things that uh, you can serve in, in many different ways, uh, but Jesus knows your works. And there is this um, story of a, of a couple that were on the mission field in Africa for 40 years, And they came back here to retire in their older age, and they were on the same boat from Africa uh, to America as President Teddy Roosevelt. And maybe you've heard this story, that Teddy Roosevelt went and he went on a hunting trip, and when he came back, he brought like a, you know, rhinoceros head, and everyone was so happy, and they had this huge uh, parade, and they actually thought, the missionaries thought it was for them, and it wasn't. No one even came to pick him up. No one came to greet him. Everyone forgot about him. That's why we need to send emails and do everything we can to not just pray for the missionaries that are on that wall downstairs, amen? We need to send encouragement to them. Uh, It's hard being a missionary. So this couple get to their one-bedroom apartment in New York that the mission board set up for them, for them to, uh, you know, retire, and they're just frustrated. And the husband said, you know, president you know, comes and kills animals and they throw a party for him. What about us? And the wife reminded him, yeah, our parade is not for this life. It's for the next. What about all the Africans that get to know Jesus because of the work that we did? You see, guys, we are not here for that a boys. Here. Jesus said, I see your works and even a cup of cold water Jesus is going to reward us for. Amen? Second thing that he says here is see, and this word see is to behold, to observe, to consider. And Jesus said the same thing in John chapter 4. He said, see, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. There is opportunity all around you especially right now. There are so many hurting people all around us. There, I believe, has never been a greater time to do ministry than right now. And what we need to do as God's people, as a loving church, as missional Christians, is look at the need and to not turn our eyes away from the need. Um, In in fact, 1 John, it says, you know, Jesus has shown his love to us by dying on uh, the cross for us. How, how can we not love? Or how, how can we say that we've been loved by God or we love God if we see a need and we don't love our brothers and sisters? And so we need to see the need. And, you know, we're part of the Calvary Chapel movement, uh, my church and, and this church. And the way that it started was a guy named Chuck Smith. Um, he was there in Huntington Beach in Southern California. And uh, I'll stay right here. Sorry, guys. And Chuck Smith did not like hippies. He's like, they need to get a job and they need to take a bath. And um, his wife, Kay, looked at the need and saw them not as a problem, but as someone's kids. 
And she said, you know, I don't know how to reach them. And so she just sat on a bench and she would pray for these hippies that are strung out and just saying, Lord, give us a chance to reach them. Let us reach one. Um, And that's, it actually started from the prayers of Kay and praying for Chuck Smith to have a heart for these hippies. And then they were one of the first churches to open up the doors uh, to those that nobody wanted. And it started a, a revival in the 60s and 70s, which this, is, this church is the fruit of that. Uh, from one gal looking, not turning her eyes away from people that nobody wanted, but she said, I want them. Jesus wants them. Amen? And so we need to look. We need to not turn our eyes away from the problems in the world and, and the things that are difficult. We need to see these things because really it's not your ability, it's your availability. Amen? And so I believe Jesus encourages missional Christians that your eyes are open to the needs around you. The third thing is, I have set before you an open door. Now, I love this, that Jesus opens the door, amen? That it's not you. I don't encourage you to try to kick doors down uh, because Jesus has given you doors, right? And when Jesus is in it, ain't nothing going to close it, amen? Amen. And so we need to do the things that God has called us to do. Now, again, in this missionary movement, as it started, uh, lots of wonderful Christians that we can um, read about. Uh, William Carey going to India. He's really the father of modern missions where he says, I'm going to contextualize, which means I'm going to become like an Indian. I'm going to dress like them. I'm going to eat like them. I'm going to talk like them. Just like Jesus, right? Jesus is the greatest missionary. God, coming to earth, spoke Hebrew ate pita bread, right? Like he stayed in his town, worked as a carpenter. He was a missionary. We look to Jesus as our example to be missionaries. So you got William Carey, David Livingston, uh, Hudson Taylor, uh, Charles Spurgeon, so many wonderful people in the first and second great awakenings. And um, there's one couple in the 50s, 1950s, Jim and Elizabeth Elliot. They went to Ecuador and... Um, they just had a heart for these people that no one could reach. And the men in this group, they were a bunch of 20-somethings with little kids. They decided, I'm, I'm going to go and I, I want to reach these people. And so the men went and they finally made contact uh, with this tribe. And they were brutally murdered on contact. And then the women went back into that village and they started ministering to the people that killed their husbands. And there was a revival that broke through and they reached that tribe. And, you know, open doors might not seem wide open and we just continue to go through. If God's called us to do something, then we continue to go through it. And it says nobody can shut it. He, Jesus, has opened it and no one can shut it. And I believe there's no better time than right now to be on mission. And when Jesus said... You know, I'm going to come back again, but wait for the Holy Spirit to his disciples, and then you'll be a missionary. You'll be a witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. I believe that God wants us to start first right where we're at, right? In our homes, in our church, in our neighborhood, in our workplaces, and then who knows? Maybe God will expand the ministry and open doors for you, but even just thinking about all the things that are happening around the world... If Jesus doesn't come back, like today, uh, which it could happen with, I mean, hey man, all the things that are happening in, in Israel, but we should act as if we have 200 more years. Let's be busy about his work, but there's such a great need all around the world that we're going to need people to go to these needs, amen? But we need to start right where we're at, and I believe Jesus encourages missional Christians You guys walk through doors, and you guys open up doors for people to be saved. Fourth thing that Jesus gives an encouragement for is you have a little strength. And this might seem like a backhanded, you know, compliment, like, oh, you're so weak. Good job. Uh, Like, I don't, is that encouraging? Yeah. Um, Anybody feel weak? You know, anybody anybody feel inadequate? And um, perfect. (laughs) right? Because that's the narrative of the Bible, is that God is big, and we are small, and God works through small people, right? He doesn't need a lot 
to do a lot. Uh, you think about uh, when Jesus multiplies the food, he takes this little kid's lunch, a Lunchable, and you know, five loaves, two fish, and he breaks it and he multiplies it and feeds everybody. He can take the little that we have and reach lots of people. Um, you know, I, um, before, oh, what am I trying to say here? Oh yeah, first time I came and taught here, I never met Ed. He just called me. He's like, hey, you're moving to Colorado. You want to teach? I'm like, uh, I guess so. And uh, we were still looking for a building up in Boulder. And I talked to this one guy because there was a building for sale. I'm like, hey, I want to start a church here. And he was a Christian. He's like, cool. I'm going to sell it for $8 million. I'll give you a deal. $3 million. I'm like, oh, sweet. How about 3000 He's like, oh, no, that's not going to work. And no joke, I get back in my car to come here to teach, and my car doesn't work. I'm like, well, there, I know where my 3,000 is going to go now. Um, three years later, we get this opportunity because um, we, we have a heart for Boulder. It's an unreached people group, and uh, we, we do ministry up on University Hill. And we just went around and walked around, and, and then we started ministering to the homeless and uh, going to the parties and just being broken and like, Lord, we need a place. And I saw that there was a, a coffee shop that was closed, and so I asked the owner who actually owned that previous building, and I'm like, hey, how about 3000 And he said yes. So, you know, God can take the little that we have, and he can multiply it. Um, there's another person that's small in stature, and God used greatly. Uh, Her name is Mother Teresa, and she entered into serving Jesus as a teenager, and then she started on her own with uh, an organization that in India, after seeing the people dying in the streets and the caste system, and so at 36 years old, with the equivalent of about five dollars, she went to just let people die in dignity. So what she did is she bought a bed and she just let people die in it and took care of them. And then she started seeing these babies that were thrown in the gutter and she started just holding them until, she, until they died. That was her ministry. She did that for many years. And in 1994, she came to America and she spoke the National Prayer Breakfast. And um, she was 84 years old. You can't see her face. It's pretty cute if you guys want to look it up in in YouTube. And uh, the Clintons are there, and the Gores are there, and they're frozen when she started saying this. The end of her speech, she said, the greatest threat to humanity is abortion. And our world has no hope when the mother does not love her own children and kills her own children to get what she wants. She goes on to say, we fight abortion with adoption. Anyone who does not want their children give them to me. I want them. You know, I would love to be a part of the generation that ends abortion, that ends human trafficking. But we need a heart like this. We need a heart to say, my doors are open. I see the opportunity and I'll do something about it. I may not have a lot of strength, but I see the need and God can do something through me. Just do one thing. You know, all these people used by God mightily, just one person. You know, D.L. Moody said, the world is yet to see a person fully surrender to God. I want to be that person. I think that should be our heart too. And I'm not there. I want to be there. Hopefully by the time I'm 84, I have that heart. Um, But I think too, in our weakness, God is made strong. And we need to become weak so God can be shown off. Amen? Amen. Fifth encouragement here that Jesus gives to a church that's missional, to Christians that are loving, is you've kept my word and have not denied my name. You've kept my word. The Bible. Amen? 60, not just one book, 66 different books written by 40 different authors, three different languages, three different continents, over 1,500 years, no contradictions, one central theme. How is that possible? It's God's word, amen? Amen. And we can trust it. And we are a church that believes and teaches and lives God's word. Now, 
the missionary movement and the great awakening, awakening started really because people started reading God's word. And uh, there was this one family, the Wesleys, and uh, the husband was kind of aloof, but the mom, rose, uh, she raised 19 kids. And two of her kids really loved the word of God. Charles and John Wesley, and they started the Methodist movement. And really what this is, is where we get the practice of like being methodical with the way that we follow Jesus. So we wake up in the morning and we pray and we read the word and then we serve and we evangelize and there's a method to it. That's what happened in the first great awakening and people got saved and it can all really spur back to this one woman who raised 19 kids and taught the word of God. Believe this thing, she said to her kids and it changed the entire world. Amen? God can use you and not deny my name. Everyone's being bold about everything else. Shouldn't we be bold about Jesus Christ, right? The one that can save, the one that holds the keys of heaven and hell, and he can open up the doors of salvation. He can set people free from addiction. We should be bold about Jesus and what he's done in our life, amen? And preaching the gospel. There's a last story about this. Um, I'm reading Jesus Freaks by DC Talk uh, with my boys, and there's this one story of uh, communist China, the police come and raid their church service in a home. And they said, we're going to kill you unless you deny Jesus' name and you spit on the Bible. And so starting with the pastor, he spit on the Bible. And then from oldest to youngest, all of them spit on the Bible. And then the youngest one there was a 12-year-old girl. She picked up the Bible said, Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing and wiped off the spit and they took her life. That's happening all around the world. And, you know, we are a church that loves Jesus, loves his word. But how can we say we'll die for Christ if we're not living for Christ? Amen. We need to live for Jesus Christ, just like we sang. And I want more of that. It's not my, when I gave my life to Jesus, it's no longer my life. It's no longer my desires. It's what Jesus wants for me. I gave my life to him. I'm crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And he's worthy. He gives some great promises here in verse 9 and 10. It says, indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie indeed. I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Now, let me just say something about uh, the Jewish people. They are God's people. Amen. I was reading this morning, John chapter eight, and it's the Jews that reject the Messiah. And Jesus says, well, your father is the father of the, uh, you know, the devil and uh, God's right in front of you and you don't believe him. And so the Jews as a people uh, for the last 2000 years have rejected Jesus, but now uh, people are becoming Christians. And in this great uh, seven year tribulation, lots of Jews are going to become Christians, amen. And so we need to pray for them. There's 2,500 missiles launched into Israel. And I don't know if you guys have been watching the news, I don't encourage it. But uh, I've never seen an anti-Semitism like the last few days. And we, we've seen this happen. History repeats itself. And anyone that comes up against God's people doesn't end well for them. And uh, we need to pray for them. We need to preach the gospel to Jewish people and see them become Christians. Amen? Um, but also, you know, we... Don't do missions. We're not loving so people will think that we're amazing. So people will come to this church. Paul, who might be the greatest uh, Christian, most successful, if you can put that in a phrase, Christian, you know, he wrote all those books, planted all those churches, and he said, the love of Christ compels me. And what he was saying there is that God's love for him motivates him to love other people. And if we're going to be a loving church, a missional church, then we need to realize this. The end of verse nine, it says, and to know that I have loved you. No greater promise in the Bible. Uh, There was a great theologian that was asked at the end of his life uh, what the greatest theological um, finding was, and there was like an awkward pause, 
in this um, conference that he was speaking at, and he was asked this question, what's the greatest theological idea that he's found? And then he said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. The love of Jesus, if you guys don't, don't know this, Jesus loves you. Maybe if you've forgotten, Jesus loves you. And what we need to do is think back to the cross. The way that Jesus loves us, he created us with love. He, he formed us in our mother's womb. He's given us a wonderful world to enjoy. But the way that he's shown his love is dying for us, is that he gave his life uh, for us, that his skin was taken off of his body, that he was beaten, that he was nailed to a tree, and he said, it is finished. We don't, we cannot earn God's love. His love is everlasting and infinite, and he loves you. Amen? And if there's anything that we do, it should be motivated because God loves me. That's it. God loves me, and if God loves me, God loves other people, and I need to tell people about God's love. Verse 10 says, Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Now, this is a wonderful promise about Jesus coming for his church before the hour of trial that will come upon the whole earth. So, um, we're not in the hour of trial yet, because we're still here. Amen? Amen. Now, it says this, I will keep you from the hour of the trial, which will come upon the whole world. That's speaking of the seven years of tribulation, and Jesus is going to come and rapture his church, his bride. He loves us. He's going to rescue us before he pours out his wrath on people that reject him. First Thessalonians chapter 4 speaks about this in great detail, that he will come, take us, and we should comfort one another with these words. Amen? That we, like, Jesus is coming back, and that's what he says, verse 11. Behold, I am coming quickly. You know what motivated the missionary movement? Getting back to the Word of God and finding Jesus is coming back at any minute. Let's get to work. I've been waking up last few weeks and just thinking, like, man, this might be the last day on earth. I might see Jesus today. Amen? Amen? the one that loves me, the one that made me, and I'll never be away from his presence again, but I also want people to see Jesus in me. Until then, I want to be busy about his work. I don't want to be, you know, caught up in in little things that don't matter. I want to take as many people to heaven with me as I possibly can. And that's why he says, hold on to what you have. Don't let anyone steal your crown. What do you have? Well, there's one thing that can ever be taken away from you, and that's Jesus. They can take everything away from us, but they can't take the Lord. But what do you have? Your spouse, your kids, your job, your neighbors, your coworkers. Guys, hold on to what you have and bring them with you to heaven. Amen? You are on a mission to see people get saved and know Jesus. And verse 12 talks about, uh, well, I'll read it to you. He who overcomes. Any overcomers in here? Yes, you are. If, well, hey, uh, if you're a Christian, you're an overcomer. Any overcomers in here? Because yes. it says, the Bible says, you're more than a conqueror. It says that greater is in you than he who is in the world. That you are covered by the blood of Jesus, and when the Father sees you, he sees Jesus Christ. Amen? Positionally, you're an overcomer. But practically, are you an overcomer? Are you walking in that holiness? Are you walking in the good works that God has for you? Because... He's made you an overcomer in Jesus Christ. And he says, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God and he will go out no more. And I, man, what a wonderful promise that we will be in the presence of Jesus forever. Think about this, like, you know, there's some insight of what heaven's gonna be like and Revelation gives us some insight. Uh, But it says what God is going to be doing for all of eternity is showing us his mercy and kindness for the ages to come. What that means is every moment in heaven, we will never leave his presence. And every moment we get a new insight of his love, that literally his love is so big that it's gonna take all of eternity to understand his love. Don't you want other people to know that? Don't you want other people to experience that here and in heaven? 
missional churches like this one will do that. And it says, my God, you know, there are no grandkids in heaven. And I'm not naive to think that some people in here may not believe in Jesus or may not be on mission. I know your pastor is, I know your leadership team is, and I know historically this church has been on mission, but a church is built up of people, God's people. And for us as a church to continue to be on mission, Jesus needs to be your God. You need to decide to be on mission. And I encourage you, if you have not walked through the door of salvation, today is the day, Sunday, May 16th, 2021. Today is the day of salvation. And also for you Christians, you're going to heaven, bring people with you. Amen? Last phrase as Jesus closes each letter, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Father, thank you. God, we just ask, Holy Spirit, whatever you need to speak to us, Lord, if you're calling people to salvation, God, I ask, Lord, that you bring them, Lord, that you strengthen them to walk away from sin, to repent and turn towards you. God, thank you that you change lives. God, we ask as a church and as your people that we would be on mission. God, we ask that you would open up our eyes to the opportunities and the needs around us, Lord, and that you would empower us to do the things that you've called us to do. And so, Holy Spirit, thank you. We ask a fresh filling in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that you've been encouraged by this Bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of Calvary Aurora. For prayer or a copy of this study, call us at 877-30-GRACE. That's 877-304-7223. Or visit us online at calvaryaurora.org. Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week.